Hello everyone, welcome to this year's last minute crash review for the AP Biology exam. In this video, I'm going to share some general tips and pointers, hit some really important content that's commonly questioned on the AP Biology exam, and review some basic skills that might pop up on the AP Bio test this year. Remember, this is a fast review. I do talk fast, and it's definitely not meant as introductory content, so if you need to go back and do a deeper dive into any of these topics, make sure to dig into some of my other videos and resources, or look at some of the materials provided by your teacher. Remember that AP Biology is a trademark owned by the College Board, which is not affiliated with and does not endorse this video. Let's talk about the format real quick. The test is three hours long. It is in two parts, part one and part two. They are both 90 minutes. Part one is multiple choice questions. There are 60 of them. Part two is six questions. Those are the free response questions. Both sections are weighted equally. So 50% of your grade comes from part one and 50% of your grade comes from part two. Remember there are two long and four short biology FRQs, each testing different sets of science practices and skills. And the multiple choice questions can come individually or as sets with a stimulus. So we might have a graph or a data set or some experiment and we're asked for four or five questions after reading that information. Be sure you budget your time wisely and read all the information that the exam provides for you. On the day of the exam, you should bring two pens, blue or black ink, two number two pencils, and a calculator. College Board has a list of the approved ones. It's pretty much any calculator as long as it doesn't connect to the internet. You will be provided with a formula sheet from the College Board and then some extra paper if you need it to continue writing your free responses. If you don't go to the school where you're taking the exam, make sure you bring a school ID or a government ID like a driver's license so people can identify you on the day of the test. Do not bring cell phones or smartwatches or tablets or cameras. They will either be confiscated or you will be removed from the testing area. On the free response questions, be prepared for two long questions and four short ones. The two long ones are more points, but all of them are important to try to answer. I'll go through some other tips throughout this video, but one of the most important ones a lot of teachers say is ATP for answer the prompt. So make sure you answer what the question is asking, no less, no more. As far as the topics that are going to show up on the AP Biology exam, here they are and their percentage breakdowns. They're all treated with about similar weights on the exam, but natural selection does show a little bit more than some of the other units. So make sure that you review topics related to natural selection and evolution as much as you can. Now let's cover some content or themes that are frequently going to show up on the exam. And these are going to come up in no particular order. So be aware that this is not the order in which you might have learned this content, but interleaving these topics is better for studying. So here we go. Let's start with the basic unit of life itself, cells. All cells are surrounded by a cell membrane, a phospholipid bilayer. They all contain genetic information, mostly DNA, and they all contain cytoplasm. All living things have a genome and a genome is in the entire set of genetic material or all the biological instructions for one organism. Remember that different units that code for different proteins in DNA are called genes. And remember that genes code for specific proteins which give cells and organisms their traits. But different parts of the genetic instructions are used in different types of cells so not every cell in a multicellular organism expresses the exact same DNA. So for example we have neurons and skin cells and red blood cells and they're all going to look a little bit different from each other because they have have expressed different sections of the DNA. Hopefully you remember a little bit about protein synthesis where the enzyme RNA polymerase is going to synthesize mRNA molecules in the five to three prime direction by reading the template DNA strand in the three to five prime direction. So we have our RNA polymerase synthesizing that molecule, the mRNA leaving the nucleus and then undergoing certain modifications, which we'll get into a little bit later. And then in the cytosol at the ribosome, we have our tRNA bringing around our amino acids and it recognizes recognizes each codon with an anti-codon on the tRNA, and that amino acid chain is built from the mRNA transcript. In prokaryotic organisms, this happens all at once. Transcription is coupled to translation, but in eukaryotic organisms, we have this occurring in our different locations. Once we have our amino acid sequence, we can undergo even more protein modifications to get the final functional protein. Now again, there's lots of regulation of genes and transcription and translation. Some types of gene regulation in prokaryotic organisms include operons. Let's start with inducible operons. In its usual state, we do not have transcription happening. That's mostly because we have a repressor here that's bound to a section called the operator in this operon. Now the purpose of these genes, LACZ, LACY, and LACA, is to provide instructions for the cell to build parts of proteins to digest lactose. If there's no lactose in the cell, these genes don't need to be turned on because we don't need any enzyme to digest lactose. But when lactose does show up, a version of it, allolactose, can bind to the repressor, removing it from the operator. This allows RNA polymerase to move down the operon and transcription can occur. 
Once transcription occurs, we have the lack mRNA, which can then later be transcribed into a protein that can digest the lactose. Once that lactose is all gone, it no longer binds to the repressor, which means it's back on the operator and we cannot have transcription any longer. Now, there are many levels of gene expression and regulation in eukaryotic organisms, and there's many points at which the transcripts can be changed or modified along the way to becoming active proteins. There's even pre-transcriptional regulation that can occur. A big one to know is part of RNA processing where we have introns and exons. Our non-coding sequences are introns, and then those are later removed so that we only have exons in our final mRNA transcript. With alternative splicing, we can get multiple versions of mRNA from the same original gene. Be sure you know the basics of what PCR is, gel electrophoresis is, DNA sequencing, and then bacterial transformation. You won't have to detail step-by-step step how these occur or the laboratory procedures for these, but you should know the purpose. For example, PCR is the amplification of DNA to make lots and lots of copies from a small bit. Gel electrophoresis is the separation of our DNA molecules based on size so that we can see any patterns after they're cut with restriction enzymes. This is useful for evolutionary analysis as a step in genetic transformation or for forensics and crime scene analysis. Bacterial transformation or genetic transformation involves the removal of a gene of interest from a particular organism, inserting it into a plasmid so that our gene of interest can then be taken up by our organism that will later go and express that gene as a protein. Make sure you know the four main categories of biological macromolecules, nucleic acids, proteins, carbohydrates, and lipids. Know their monomers, the structure of their monomers. So nucleic acids are made of nucleotides, Proteins are made of amino acids, carbohydrates are made of monosaccharides, and lipids are made of fatty acids and glycerols. Organisms use feedback loops to maintain their internal environments and respond to internal and external changes. Feedback loops help organisms regulate homeostasis, and the failure to maintain homeostasis can cause disease or death. Negative feedback loops are very common in organisms. These are going to result in the slowing of a process or getting something back to a set point. So for example, blood pressure, blood sugar regulation, temperature regulation, regulation so that the body can return to the levels at which it needs. Positive feedback loops are an amplification of a particular output or signal. It's going away from homeostasis, so for example, in increased contractions during childbirth, the production of milk in mammals, or even the ripening of fruit. Cellular energetics is another really important topic in AP biology, and beginning with cellular respiration and the steps involved, the three main parts are glycolysis, the citric acid cycle, and then the electron transport chain with oxidative phosphorylation. Glycolysis occurs in the cytosol outside of the mitochondria. Our citric acid cycle occurs in our mitochondrial matrix and the electron transport chain occurs across the inner mitochondrial membranes in order to establish a proton gradient for ATP synthesis. Remember that oxygen is our final electron acceptor. At the end of this process, photosynthesis and cellular respiration are highly connected, especially within the carbon cycling of the biosphere. Cellular respiration metabolizes organic molecules, which are sugars, and returns carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is our byproduct. Photosynthesis uses uses carbon dioxide so it removes CO2 from the atmosphere and fixes carbon into our organic molecules or sugars. Remember photosynthesis takes place in chloroplasts and we think that the very first chloroplasts were actually prokaryotic organisms that performed photosynthetic like pathways and that they were engulfed by larger single cellular organisms who after a very long time formed a symbiotic relationship together and developed into the chloroplasts that we know today. This is part of the theory of endosymbiosis and some of the evidence pieces that point to this are the double membrane that surrounds the chloroplasts and the fact that the chloroplast itself has its own DNA. All right, let's get to the good stuff. There's two main parts of photosynthesis that we're gonna study at the AP biology level. We have the light dependent or the light reactions of photosynthesis, and we have the dark or carbon fixation reactions. Now remember, all of this is taking place within the chloroplast, and the space in the chloroplast is called the stroma, but then there's also a third membrane, this thylakoid membrane, and these membranes are gonna be able to provide us with concentration gradients for some really essential parts of the process to happen. Now the light dependent reactions are dependent on light and so sunlight is going to be absorbed by chlorophyll pigments at first and water, one of our main ingredients for photosynthesis, is going to enter here. Now we have complexes of proteins and pigments called photosystems and these photosystems, photosystem 2 and photosystem 1, are basically there to split the water and pass electrons down an electron transport chain, very similar to the electron transport chain that we see in cellular respiration. But in this electron transport chain, the final electron acceptor is NADP+, which will yield NADPH, 
a very important ingredient for the next part of photosynthesis. This process also is going to generate a proton gradient, and we also have ATP synthase here, just like we have in cellular respiration. And so ATP synthase will generate ATP, and that ATP will also help with the next part of photosynthesis. So again, those light reactions take place within the thylakoid or across the membranes of the thylakoid. They involve protein complexes called photosystem 2 and photosystem 1. Water goes in here, water is split here, and oxygen comes out of that splitting of the water. So all of the oxygen on Earth actually comes from the light reactions of photosynthesis here. In AP Biology, you do not need to memorize all the steps in this electron transport chain or the finer details of it. These are the main components you will need to know about this part of the pro process. Your teacher may go into more detail about the different protein complexes complexes or what's happening with the electrons here. But it's really important to know that at the end of the light dependent reactions, we have ATP and NADPH to power the dark reactions or the carbon fixation reactions that happen outside the thylakoid in the stroma of the chloroplast. These reactions are part of a cycle called the Calvin cycle. And in the Calvin cycle, carbon dioxide enters and eventually, with the help of ATP and NADPH, sugars are produced. In AP Biology, you do not need to memorize the steps of the Calvin cycle, but you do need to know what goes in and what comes out of it. Now, these sugars are not going to be glucose immediately after the Calvin cycle. In fact, it takes a couple more turns of the Calvin cycle and a few more steps to get to glucose, but you can say sugars or organic compounds are generated here. These sugars do contain carbon, which comes directly from carbon dioxide that enters the carbon cycle. Some common topics and themes that show up related to molecules and molecular biology, enzymes at high temperatures will unfold or denature or lose their shape and lose then their function. So remember, an increase in temperature above the optimum range for the enzyme can definitely alter the shape of the active site and reduce a reaction rate. Water has a lot of very special properties, such as high heat of vaporization, the fact that it's polar, surface tension, just to name a few. This can relate back to a lot of reactions and processes within our body and cells, including homeostasis. For example, that high heat of vaporization is involved with sweat because the water and sweat absorbs a large quantity of heat during that liquid to gas phase change, which is going to lower body temperature and bring us back to the temperature that our body needs to be. You definitely want to be able to recognize how different molecules are going to be able to cross the membrane. For example, small nonpolar molecules like carbon dioxide and oxygen can freely pass through membranes. So speaking of membranes, cells have membranes that allow them to establish and maintain internal environments that are going to be different from their external environments. And then we have internal membranes that are going to help with different cellular processes and it minimizes different interactions that are going to be competing within the cell and increases our surface areas where our reactions can occur. And we can also use this as evidence for the endosymbiosis hypothesis. But all of these themes are important when we talk about organelles. Now, these are the organelles that you really should be able to know, recognize, and understand how their functions work for AP Biology. There's a lot of other organelles out there and some major ones that are not on this list but not on the exam, these are the ones that might show up and you might be tested on. Out of this list, the most important ones you really need to know and recognize are cell membranes, mitochondria, and chloroplasts. When we're talking about cell membranes, remember these are very complex. They go beyond just a phospholipid bilayer. They have integral proteins that are embedded in the membrane for transport, cell surface reception, cell identification, other activities. They also have carbohydrates and cholesterols in the membrane, so be able to recognize how membranes are going to control contribute to cell structure, function, communication, a lot of other themes and processes. Mitochondria and chloroplasts, of course, are going to show up when we talk about cellular energetics. We already talked about mitochondria and chloroplasts a little bit with endosymbiosis, but make sure you're very familiar with them, their role and their structure for both cellular respiration and photosynthesis. All right, going back to cell membranes a little bit more, be able to recognize the phospholipid structure, how we have a polar group of the molecule, it's here in red, and then our little squiggly hydrophobic tails that are going to form the internal part or the middle of our phospholipid bilay. A lot of students really get worried about cell signaling pathways. These are not that complicated, but do remember cell signaling pathways are characterized by a signal, a transduction, and a response. That signal could be something generated by a unicellular organism or could be part of multicellular signaling pathways. Signaling pathways are highly specific and regulated, and one single signaling molecule can cause a cascade effect, releasing thousands of molecules in a cell. And these pathways we know probably evolved from a common ancestor millions of years ago. We can even look at similar molecules in pathways in different species and use this as evidence to investigate different species and how they might have evolved from a common ancestor that used very similar signaling molecules. 
Now the result of a signal transduction pathway could be something like gene expression or the production of a hormone or suppression of a genetic activity or even apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. Jumping back to more molecular structure, DNA, make sure you're very familiar with the structure of, of the nucleotide itself, and then of course the full DNA molecule. Remember that the structure of DNA is very specific. DNA is a larger molecule made of nucleotides. One nucleotide includes a phosphate group, a sugar, deoxyribose for DNA, and our nitrogenous base. So one nucleotide here would be comprised of these three sections. In the center of the DNA molecule, the nucleotides are attached by hydrogen bonds. A and T are attached with two hydrogen bonds. G and C have three. And then the backbones are also attached in covalent bonds. And to contrast it, RNA is single-sided. It does have structural similarities to DNA. It still has a sugar, a phosphate group, our nitrogenous base but RNA has uracil, DNA has thymine, DNA obviously is double-stranded, and DNA usually is just staying put in the nucleus in eukaryotic organisms, whereas RNA is gonna leave the nucleus to perform the other steps of protein synthesis. Another hot topic is the cell cycle and checkpoints. There's a number of internal controls or checkpoints that are gonna regulate progression through the cell cycle. You don't need to know specific cyclin-dependent kinase pairs or specific growth factors, but do know that if something is wrong or if there is an error detected within the cell cycle, Typically, the cell will commit apoptosis, again, program cell death, but errors in that cycle or errors in recognizing those steps could also lead to uncontrolled cell growth, disease like cancer, or we have uncontrolled cell division or unregulated cell division. Now, speaking of cell division and reproduction, mitosis is gonna produce two genetically identical daughter cells. Make sure you review different types of reproduction Meiosis is going to produce cells with half the normal amount of genetic material, generally going from diploid to haploid cells, and these are gametes or sex cells. There's a lot of different steps that contribute to genetic diversity. First of all, we have independent assortment where we have a lot of different possibilities of orientations of how the chromosomes could line up. There's random fertilization, which again happens after, but we need to be able to create these haploids to be fertilized beforehand. And then during crossing over, we can have a bunch of different combinations of information. Familiarize yourself with errors or consequences if some steps in the process of meiosis go wrong. Make sure to review cell transport situations while water move by osmosis from areas of high water potential to areas of low water potential. This is probably going to be recognizing where water would move within a certain situation is probably more likely to show up on the exam than an actual water potential problem. As far as genetics goes, inheritance patterns that might show up include single gene or monohybrid inheritance. Dihybrid inheritance is a possibility as well where we're tracking two genes. Sex-linked inheritance where we have a trait. Generally, it's going to be an X-linked, sex-linked trait that we're tracking. Remember, males only need one copy of those in order to display the trait. Females need two if it's recessive. We can talk about genetically linked inheritance. These are when two genes are close together on chromosomes, so typically they're inherited together. And then inheritance of things like traits in mitochondrial DNA. Remember, your mitochondria is going to come from the egg or the ovum, and so that is going to be inherited from the mother. As far as the ecology and the environment, there's a lot of related topics that could show up on the exams. A very common one is environmental impacts on molecular functions or environmental impacts on gene expression. So recognize how certain genes can be turned on or off or have extra expression due to certain environmental factors. Environmental pressures can also strongly influence natural selection, so make sure you connect those ideas. And then of course, population interactions like symbiotic relationships, predation, and lots of community ecology topics could show up here and there. We know that organisms have different strategies for regulating body temperature, so a type of homeostasis. Uh, two main ones are endotherms and ectotherms, where endotherms use their metabolism, so thermal energy from their metabolism, to generate the warmth that helps them maintain homeostasis, so the temperature that that they need to be. Ectotherms, though, are dependent on the environment, so they can regulate their temperatures through behaviors like moving into the sun or moving into the shade, right? like lizards here sitting on a rock, which can help them regulate their internal body temperatures. Now, when we talk about energy availability, typically smaller organisms have higher metabolic rates, they have higher energy needs, so something like a fly or a small rodent is going to have a higher metabolic rate than a larger organism like a cow, for example. And in general, obviously, organisms consume other organisms to gain energy, and a net gain of energy is going to result in growth for the organism and storage 
of energy and overall survival. And that loss of energy, we get a loss of math of mass of the organism and then later death for the organism. This is a typical trophic or energy pyramid that you might see in a diagram for AP Biology. There's different types of pyramids too, like pyramids of biomass and pyramids of numbers. But here, what we're looking at are these different trophic levels or levels that that organisms feed at. And we want to keep in mind that at every level, we have a significant amount of energy lost. So it is inefficient. We have about a 90% energy lost every single time we go up a trophic level. So now in general, remember the theme that the more biodiversity within a community or within an ecosystem, the more resistant the community is to environmental change and we have a healthier ecosystem. So if there were a particular change in the environment, there'd be fewer organisms that would be able to res resist or survive those changes. And likely we would see decreasing populations across the board. We often talk about core features that are conserved across all domains of life, and currently scientists organize life into three main domains, bacteria, archaea, and eukaryota. You're probably most familiar with the eukaryotic organisms, which are then further organized into kingdoms. Now, when we establish these groups or relationships between different organisms, uh, we can organize them in different ways. One way to display how organisms are related is through a diagram called a phylogenetic tree or a cladogram. And these can be drawn in many different ways, but it's a model that helps us visualize relationships between organisms. And we can see different branching lines and different directions for how groups have evolved or how they're related. And so a group is typically at the end of a branch and we can work backwards to see where a common ancestor might have existed between two different organisms or two different organismal groups. We also might see hash marks or these lines here representing different traits that have evolved at different times within evolutionary history. So anything that comes after a particular trait means it has it. So for here with seeds, it means that anything that comes after the seeds mark, like pine trees and flowering plants, have seeds as a characteristic. Now we can use other biochemical evidence to help us determine which proteins and DNA are similar in different organisms. This helps us construct our tree of life and gathers more evidence for evolution, helps us figure out how different organisms are related to each other. We can also use embryonic development, fossil evidence, or morphology or different physical characteristics to determine which organisms might be related and where they came from. We know that Earth's present day species developed from earlier distinct species. When we get new combinations of existing genes or mutations in genes, and these are inherited, they can be passed on to offspring and we can see variations in populations. Over time, organisms that are better adapted to their environment are more likely to survive and reproduce and pass on their genes to the next generation. For example, if we have a population of bacteria and some of those bacteria are naturally resistant to antibiotics, when we treat that population with antibiotics, only the ones with the resistance will survive. Then that gives way to give the opportunity to the resistant bacteria to survive and reproduce and pass on the resistant gene to their offspring. And what we've done here is created an antibiotic resistant population. The resistant bacteria were more fit and they have survived and reproduced at a greater rate than non-resistant bacteria. And anything we talk about with evolution is that there's variation within populations. Now we can get genetic variation in a population through a variety of ways. We've got mutation, genetic drift, and sexual selection, as well as artificial selection. And remember that evolution is the change in the genetic makeup in a population over time, not just the changing of one organism. Individuals don't evolve, populations evolve. So humans can impact the diversity within a population either making it more diverse, less diverse, or favoring a certain trait for our benefit. The way we do this is by controlling which organisms reproduce. Certain traits in cows, we, for example, milk yield, milk production over the years has increased in certain dairy cows because we select the ones that produce the most milk and choose those to go on and breed to produce more for the production of more milk. Also gonna mention convergent evolution, which is not always a type of artificial selection. In fact, it's its own type of evolution. This is when we see similar selective pressures that lead to similar phenotypes in very different populations or different organisms. One of the most commonly used examples of this is how birds and bats both evolved flight separately and independently. What happens is that environmental pressures are gonna cause certain traits to be more favorable within a population, and then those individuals will survive and reproduce. So we could see this in body plans of certain species. We could see this in drug resistance in certain pathogens. Again, that's human action because we've created those drugs. 
We've seen this in antifreeze proteins, in particular fish, both in the Arctic and in the Antarctic, two different species, two different locations, but similar selective environmental pressures are gonna produce a similar type of protein for these fish to survive. Well, Hardy-Weinberg is actually an equation that we can use to determine the frequency of alleles in a population at a given time. Hardy-Weinberg is used as a model for describing and predicting allelic frequencies in non-evolving populations. Remember, it represents ideal populations that aren't changing, and since natural populations do change, Hardy-Weinberg provides us with a baseline to gauge that degree of change. Now, there's two equations you're going to need to know in order to do Hardy-Weinberg problems. So these are provided to you on the formula sheet that you'll get for the AP Biology exam, so there's no need to memorize them. So P is going to equal the frequency of the dominant allele in a population. Sometimes we represent that with a capital letter, like big A. Next up, Q is going to represent the frequency of the recessive allele in a population. So for example, little a. P squared is the frequency of homozygous dominant genotypes in the population. So for example, big A, big A. 2PQ is going to be the frequency of the heterozygous genotype in the population. So big A, little a. And then you guessed it, Q squared is going to represent the frequency of the homozygous recessive genotype in a population. All right, we're getting into some general tips, and so these are things that I'm just gonna go through very quickly to make sure you remember for the exam. Remember to write in complete sentences. You do have to write in sentence form, but you don't need to write full paragraphs. Make sure you avoid bullet points, lists, outlines, drawings. Don't waste too much time obsessing over perfect grammar and spelling and points are not counted off for spelling errors as long as the graders can understand you. Don't waste your time restating the questions. Remember the two long FRQs do have more points, so you wanna to try to answer those to the best of your ability. You do wanna to try to answer all of the FRQs, but the longer ones, there's more points opportunities on them. Make sure to review experimental design because you will be asked about that on at least one of the FRQs, and make sure to avoid lengthy explanations. Take out words like thus, just write in simple sentences that are straightforward and to the point. Avoid words like love, prove, because that's not a great word statistically to include, and any absolutes like always or never, and make sure to gut check your response just to see if it makes sense before you submit your answers. In experimental design, make sure you recognize how we measure dependent variables. Remember, these are the things that are measured and how we take our data in the experiment. Independent variables are the things that are changed, tested, or manipulated. Think I, the experimenter, what am I changing for the independent variable? And D, what am I measuring for my data for the dependent variable? When it's asking you to make a prediction, make sure you state something specific. Don't just say, I think this variable will change, or I think there will be a difference. You do wanna make sure that you include whether it's an increase, a decrease, death, growth, whatever. But you don't need to include your justification unless it asks you to justify, which it probably will on a particular step of the FRQ. But answer what the question is asking. Don't do more, don't do less. Now you will have to create some sort of graph on the AP Biology exam. Make sure you choose the most appropriate graph to explain your data. I do have a whole video on that if you'd like to check it out. Line graphs usually show a change over time. Bar graphs usually display the comparison of different categories. You might have to draw a scatter plot as well. It is unlikely you would have to create a pie chart for the AP Bio exam. More than likely, you'll probably have to create a line or a bar graph. Just make sure you choose the appropriate one for the exam. Be sure you're familiar with your place values. This is just a slide to remember which ones are which because sometimes if you're calculating something, you may be asked to round to a specific place value. For example, round your answer to the nearest hundredth place. You will not be asked to use significant figures, so don't worry about that on the exam. Make sure to review error bars and know how to determine if there's an overlap between the bars of two or more sample means. Remember, if error bars are not overlapping, there is a statistically significant difference between the values, which means our experimenters can consider the measured values as not the same. But if the error bars are overlapping at any point, then we can probably say there is not a statistically significant difference between the values and probably not a statistically significant difference in the data. So if we look at this graph here, rarely or never, and then more than weekly, these error bars do not overlap, but most of the other error bars do at some point. As far as the math, there are some equations on your formula sheet that you probably shouldn't waste too much time on because it's not likely they'll show up on the exam, and that's standard deviation, standard error of the mean, surface area equations, and pH equations. They are on the formula sheet, but it's not likely you'll see them on the test. 
Equations you should be familiar with are things like the chi-square, the Hardy-Weinberg equations, water potential, population growth, and carrying capacity, and maybe Simpson's diversity index, though it's probably not going to be on your test. I do have a longer video going through examples of each of these, so be sure to check that out if you're interested in doing a fast AP Biology math review. But really quickly, I wanted to highlight chi-square because this is something that a lot of students get stressed out about. It is used in science to test if data that you observe from an experiment is the same as the data that you would expect to come or predict from the experiment. What's really important in chi-square is to know how to do it and how to interpret the results. Sometimes you'll use this in a genetics problem, and if you're using it in a genetics problem, you'll probably state a null hypothesis, something like the data are consistent with the predicted method of inheritance. You calculate your chi-square value, and then you make sure you know your degrees of freedom, which is the number of categories total minus one, in this particular case, if we're looking at colors, we have one, two, three, four, five, six colors minus one, that would be five degrees of freedom. After we got our chi-square value, we would look at that on our critical value table, and we would see if our chi-square value was greater than the critical value in the chart. Please go back and check out my chi-square video or my AP Biology Math video if you want to see a full example of this. Here are some examples of null hypotheses which you might need to be able to state. Again, if you're talking about a null hypothesis in genetics, you would say something like the data are consistent with the predicted method of inheritance. If you reject a null hypothesis, that means that there is some difference in the data in the experiment and that the variables did have an effect on the particular outcome of the experiment. Phew, we're coming to the end. I have lots of other AP Biology resources and some FRQ tips, but thank you for sticking with me this long. Best of luck on your AP Biology exam. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching. Give this video a like if it's been helpful and I'll see you later.